So this is part one of an overview of um, NCHAP. So let's start with the respondents. We have a sample of 3,642 main respondents and 1,500 partners. Um, partners were invited by the main respondents. And so we did not have contact information for partners. So we had to rely on the main respondent to invite their partner. So as you can imagine, there's some selection into who has a partner who participated. For example, um, we were following up on why someone didn't invite their partner and someone responded, I just didn't think they'd be interested. So just keep that in mind whenever you're using the partner data, but we're still pretty excited that we have 1500 partners. We also have time diary data. We have completes from almost 2,000 of the main respondents, 841 partners. I'll talk a lot more about that in the part two, but just want to mention that if we could, we got the time diaries on the same day because they completed those surveys about a specific day. And when the data are weighted, they're representative of couples in the US with um, a partner. And we say one partner here, but actually we have people that have that are living with more than one romantic partner in the survey. It's a small number, like less than 70. But it's representative of couples in the United States who, who are between age 20 and 60, the main respondent, who are married or cohabiting and able to read English or Spanish. And we'll talk more about reading later. So we use the Gallup panel to collect these data. And you might be wondering, because there's a lot of different ways to collect data, and there's a lot of different providers out there who will help collect data. The reason why we worked with Gallup is, well, first of all, as Wendy mentioned, they have an incredible amount of expertise in data collection and have been doing this for a really long time. Um, but what I like about the Gallup panel is that they screened folks based on their answer to a question, do you identify as LGB? I think it was LGBT. Um, and by answering yes to that question, we were able to target a large number of folks that identified as LGBT to be included in the sample. That also means that we have a large oversample of people that are bisexual. So just something to keep in mind because not everybody who is in a different gender couple is necessarily heterosexual. So I wanna mention that, um, but we used that sampling frame to be able to build out our um, our sample, the NCHAT sample. So it is nationally representative because it was mostly based off a randomly generated telephone sample. So most of the respondents had answered a phone call prior to 2018, um, a random digit dial phone call. And starting in 2018 and up to now, um, Gallup does do some phone calls, but they're mostly now doing an address-based sampling frame um, to get more people into the sample. So a random letter, if you get a random letter from Gallup, it might have money in it and it might have a survey in it. So make sure you open it up. So they send people little bits of money and surveys to fill out and then to eventually opt into the panel. That's because nobody answers phone calls from people they don't know anymore. So, um, and the original frame in 2018 did include cell phone frame and a um, landline frame. I think it was 60% cell phone, 40% landline whenever they um, were, as they were moving towards getting out of the field of doing phone calls. Overall, the panelists in the survey, and there's 100,000 plus folks, um, they can be surveyed by phone, web, mail, or text messaging for the most part. And we, people will, so the survey was in Qualtrics, and so folks could I could fill out that survey either on their phone or on a computer. Um, and the current panel size is over 100,000 folks, and they also have about a half a million people who have agreed to be contacted for a one-time study. And we were able to use some of that sample to supplement the number of individuals we had that were not heterosexual in the sample. So I talked a little bit about the sampling frame already. And I talked a little bit about um, inviting the respondents and talked about the time diary days. So I feel like I covered this slide. So for survey development and data collection, one thing to note about NCHAD is even if you're not interested in using the data themselves, as somebody who has collected data from community samples um, and has collected data from population samples, one thing I like about the NCHAT survey is that it's gender neutral and inclusive survey which was actually a lot more difficult than I expected it to be when we were working on survey design, especially for a survey about couple relationships, because so often these things are gendered. Um, questions are gendered to husband or wife, et cetera. Um, so it's a gender neutral and inclusive survey. And I also wanna say that I like 
you know, if we're a psychologist writing our own survey, you could go to the end chat surveys, which are all online, and you could pull in some demographic questions that you might want to use, and then you could harmonize your data with the end chat data. And we worked pretty hard on these questions. And so um, I'm pretty confident. I will mention one little revision I would make to one of our demographic questions as I go through the slides, but I like it just as a resource in and of itself, the surveys. Um, and we have posted them online in both English and Spanish. Um, Wendy mentioned the crowdsourcing and we were very appreciative of all of the feedback that we got from folks. Like for example, I remember thinking that our survey was gender neutral and inclusive. And then someone mentioned in the crowdsourcing that we were only asking people who chose woman as their gender about pregnancy. And so that allowed us to go back and make a revision um, based on that because it's not only women that can get people that identify that women that can get pregnant. And then we did two rounds of pilot testing as well as cognitive interviewing. And that was all done with our partners at Gallup. And <laughs> respondents thought the survey was too long because Gallup really strongly believes in like five or 10 minute surveys. And we had it 40 minutes. So we thought we were doing really good. I don't know if any of you work with, I work with a lot with a psychologist and I remember some of our surveys being really long, but we did get it down to 40 minutes. Um, and then we did increase the postpaid incentive a little bit because of um, people's reaction to the um, length of the survey. Okay, so here's a timeline of NCHAT. So we did survey development and pilot testing in summer and fall of 2019. And then we were all ready to go in February of 2020 and we're very, very excited. And then um, this little thing called the COVID-19 pandemic happened. Um, and we were um, thrown for a loop by that. I was also moving to Minneapolis that semester. And so we heard from our partners at NACHD asking us if we would consider adding some things about COVID to NCHAT, which we did. So we did a pretty extensive revision. Also, since I had just moved to Minneapolis and we had a racial reckoning in the United States with the murder of George Floyd, we also added some questions to address George Floyd's murder. And that happened in April through August. NCHAT entered the field in September of 2020. Um, also, I'll mention that Gallup was already collecting some questions about COVID. So we already, and so were a lot of other folks during this time. So we were able to, we didn't have to do quite as much pilot testing with the revised survey because we were able to tap into some of the things other folks were already doing. Um, we did add some additional LGBT recruitment sample from Gallup. We were trying to get the, we were worried that COVID was going to end and that we were not, we were going to be like in the field asking all these COVID questions and they wouldn't be relevant anymore because COVID was going to be over. So we tried to get our data as quickly as possible. Little did we know that here we would be on Zoom um, and used to Zoom this many years later. Um, we, so just marking some things, you know, about COVID. So this is all in those first months of COVID. So September, you know, we didn't have any vaccines that, that fall of 2020. Um, a lot of us were still staying at home a lot. We had the first vaccines were authorized in December. Um, also, another thing that was going on was a lot of Asian hate crimes that was happening. And Wendy and I were ruminating about, we were in the field with a survey focused on discrimination with all of these Asian American hate crimes going on. So we added additional sample of Asian Americans to the, to the study to make sure that we had sufficient power to be able to understand their experiences during COVID as well. And we came out of the field in April of 2021. And so it was really those about, you know, the, the first nine, the second nine months, I guess we would say, um, that for, of that first year of COVID is um, when we were in the field. So NCHAT is a multi-method study. Um, for the survey, we have several questions and you can see the survey online. Um, items about family functioning, the division of labor, items about health, um, so physical health and mental health, um, health behaviors, as well as um, health, uh, like if you have a disease or cancer. Um, we also have several items about stress and discrimination. Uh, we have a full household roster. Um, so you know how everybody in the household is related to everybody else in the household. Um, what else do we have in here? We have time diary data. So it's modeled off the American Time Use Survey, if you're familiar with that survey. Uh, people filled it out on their phones or on their computers during the time diary day that they were assigned and they reported every activity. And we also asked about secondary activities. 
We have more detailed activity, family activities because of um, Wendy and I being family researchers uh, than you might typically see in the American Time Use Survey. And we also have dyadic time diary data um, if possible, like I mentioned um, earlier. We are also working on contextual data right now and we'll talk about that later um, today. So we have state and county contextual measures of structural racism, sexism, and cis heterosexism that we're in the process of appending to NCHAT, as well as state and county COVID contextual data as well. And then we also have five dry blood spots from about 900 of our respondents. And what that was collected is that folks were sent a um, fancy sheet of paper. I always like when I try to describe these data because it doesn't sound near as um, good as my neuroimmunological colleagues describe it, but they are sent a fancy piece of paper and they pricked their own finger with some detailed instructions and dropped five spots of blood in special circles on that piece of paper. And then they let it dry and then they mailed it back to us. And those are in a deep freezer. And we're hoping to get funding to assay those blood spots um, soonish. Um, and we're hoping to assay them for different markers of stress biomarkers. And those are listed there. So let's talk a little bit about our response rates. The overall NCHAT response rate was 28%. And you can see it was a little bit higher for our same gender couples, a little lower for our different gender, well, lower for our gen different gender couples. The recontact sample are the folks that we added from calling them um, during, because we weren't picking up enough people that were in same gender couples in our, um, in, the NCHAT, in the panel. So we did use that recontact sample and recruited some of them by phone. If we got them on the phone, we had a higher response rate for them. The response rates vary considerably based on survey processes, so the demographic characteristics of the individual sample, the mode of collection, sampling constraints, and time in the field. And you can learn more about response rates now. Um, here is one citation that you can learn about. A lot of us think of response rates as the strongest indicator of data quality. So I've been thinking and working on um, how we can think about data quality outside of just response rates. So first of all, we did have sources of bias that were corrected during the waiting procedure because we had some demographic information about everybody who was invited. So the waiting procedure was able to correct for some of the sources of bias in the data collection. We also compared our outcome variables, um, like our key ones like relationship quality and health outcomes by weighted and unweighted samples. And there is little to no difference between the outcome variables between the weighted and unweighted samples, which suggests there's little relation between our outcome variables and our sampling. But we also compared our early and late responders because sometimes late responders are considered to be more like non-responders. And we found no significant differences in relationship satisfaction in the Cantrell scale, which is a scale, Gallup loves the scale and they collect it pretty often. And it's a scale of, um, on a ladder, on a scale of one to 10, where do you feel like you fall in terms of the quality of your life? We did find a few significant differences about two of the CSD items, not the whole, not all of them, and one well-being items where the early responders had some better outcomes than the late responders. Though overall, the substantive differences were small and the magnitude of differences was small, though, of course, we can never argue that we're not underestimating some of the aspects of health and well-being during the pandemic because, you know, obviously for all of us, it was, well, let me revise that. For some of us, it was very stressful. For others of us, it was less stressful. And we're, I would never claim that we don't have some selection based on how stressed you were during the pandemic. But we do have little evidence of non-response bias. And you can go into really great detail about this topic in the methodology report, which is available on the NCHAO website and several tables of analyses related to this, which is kind of cool. OK, so let's talk some about the sample characteristics and about some items. So marital status, okay, so I'm a marriage and cohabitation and intimate relationship researcher, so we got to talk about that. So I'm going to be showing you some unweighted estimates and some weighted estimates. And for some variables, the weighting is not going to make that big of a difference, but for others, it's going to make a really big difference. So just note that. Um, in terms of, so we had slightly... When you look at the unweighted data, the cohabiting is a little bit higher, 26% um, and married to 74%. You can see the unweighted ends there. The um, There is some correction for that when we weight the data. And part of that is due to our oversampling of people that aren't heterosexual. Um, and so where marriage hasn't been as accessible for as long. So that's how that looks. For gender and sexual identity, we started with the question of what sex appears on your original birth certificate. 
And so you can see we are pretty, pretty evenly split between um, the numbers of folks based that had male and female assigned to them on their birth certificate. When our gender question was, which of the following best describes your gender, man, and they had to select one, man, woman, trans man, trans woman, or do not identify as any of the above. And I want to make an important note here that if you're interested in people that are, um, that their sex assigned at birth does not match their sex that they currently go by now or their gender, I should say, their sex assigned at birth doesn't match their gender, you would want to ask both of the questions that I showed you because some people, um, they reported that they were male sex at birth, but they reported woman as their gender identity, which makes total sense to me, um, given the people that I know that are transgender. Um, and so if you want to, so you couldn't just ask this item and pick up those folks in your data if that's what you want to intend to do with this item. But you can see here that um, we did have folks that identified as another gender, and we did have folks that identified as transgender as well as based on the two items for transgender. And so, um, though, of course, we mostly had people that were cis men and cis women. For those folks that said they were another gender, so those about 98 folks, I think, that we had that said that they were another gender, you can see here, we gave them the option to say, do any of these terms describe your gender? And here you can select all that apply. So we have non-binary, two-spirit, agender, gender fluid, gender neutral, gender queer, other, don't know. And if they said other, we asked them to specify. About a third of respondents chose more than one identity, which is kind of interesting. And some of the things that people wrote in were androgynous, gender nonconforming, and transmasculine. And the most popular of the other genders was non-binary. So in terms of the gender identity of couples, I like to use the terms same gender and different gender. And I like to use the terms same gender and different gender because first of all, um, the genders aren't the same. Or I mean, let me revise that. Gender, I'm using gender instead of sex because gender is really what we're reporting on in this study. And I'm using different gender and same gender because I don't consider the genders to be opposite. So I avoid the term opposite sex whenever I'm talking about couples. And I definitely do not like the term heterosexual couple or gay couple or lesbian couples because that erases um, any sexual identity besides heterosexual in our couples that are different gender. So that's kind of my reasoning for using these terms. And non-binary couples is another term, I actually kind of like the way we're using these here because, you know, when I talk about it, I use different gender and same gender, but it's probably better just to talk about non-binary couples, transgender couples, man, man, woman, woman couples, and man, woman couples. And this actually should probably be cis man, cis man couples, cis woman, cis woman, because it's just better to just be specific when we're talking about these gender identities, because it's just better to use language, because I like to call people what they want to be called. And I'm sure most of you, hopefully, are, or all of us are on the same page on that one. So cis man, cis woman. We have about 2,500 couples, um, and then we have about 941 cis man, cis man, and cis woman, cis woman, 74 transgender couples, and 134 non-binary couples. And to be in those, some couples included a trans partner and a non-binary partner. Um, we had less than 10 of those, so they aren't shown here as an actual N, because we're not showing any Ns. That's, that's a smaller than 10 on these slides. Um, what else can I say about this that I was just thinking? Um, oh, here's a big, here's one of those places where you can see the weighting makes a difference. Now, for those of us that don't do weighting, so I know we have a variety of different disciplines that are here, um, which is awesome because these data are for people from a variety of different disciplines and very different perspectives. You might be scared about the weighting, like for some reason that you're going to weight the data and it's going to like take away your significant findings and it's going to change things. It's really correcting for that sampling selection. It also allows you to make a claim that you're given a population estimate. So don't worry when you see that um, it does. It, you still have the power to run your analyses is what I'm trying to say. The weighting is not eliminating the power that you have from having 941 couples that are cis man, cis man, or cis woman, cis woman, for example. It's just correcting the estimates and correcting the standard errors to account for um, sampling design. So that's the reason why we're seeing some of these differences. Because you and the and when you see these big differences, that will show you the oversamples in the study. Okay, and by oversample, I mean, we have extra people than we would expect from a random draw of the population 
that are in man, man, woman, woman couples, for example. So hopefully that makes sense, everybody. Okay, race, ethnicity. So for race, we asked, well, the, let, me rev let me say first, the very, very first question that you're asked about your race in the NCHAT survey is an open-ended item where you can report your race and write in whatever your race or ethnicity and write in whatever you want. So it was an open-ended question. Then we asked people um, versions of like what we usually see in a census kind of question. And so here is the race question and you could select as many as you wanted. And so when you're coding race in NCHAT, you have to pay attention because you have to use several different variables because these variables are coded like as dichotomies, did they endorse white or did they not endorse white as opposed to just one? So you have some extra coding to do there. For ethnicity, we asked people, are you Hispanic, Latino, Latina, Lat and X? And I would probably add E or Latine um, to this as well, or Spanish or Spanish origins. That's one revision I would make to this item. I would also allow people to select as many of these as they wanted because we force people to choose one, two, three, four, or five. And in terms of the fives, a lot of the things that were written in were, I'm Cuban and I'm Puerto Rican for example. So I don't know why we didn't let, make this a select all that apply, but if you are ever using these items for your own survey, I would make this a select all that apply. And then we also have a select all that apply for if you chose that you are white or if you chose that you are some other race, you were asked, are you Southwest Asian, Middle Eastern, or North African? Um, and so those are those items. Okay. So here we have um, a non-exclusive coding of race. And I want to talk about this for a second. And so um, I've been talking about this whenever I give presentations about NCHAT that the National Academy has had a meeting about structural racism a few months ago that I attended virtually. And you can find the recordings online and I suggest that you do so and you watch this talk by Dr. Desi Rodriguez-Smalls. She's an assistant professor at UCLA and she gave this amazing talk about how we are erasing some indigenous identities um, whenever we collect data. And so after listening to her talk where she basically burned it all to the ground and it was an amazing talk, um, I went back and reanalyzed um, the NCHAT data just to look and see how many people we had that endorsed that they were Native American or Indigenous or um, Indian, um, American Indian. And we had 140 people that endorsed that, which I was like, oh, that's a lot higher than I thought it was. But when you make people have only one race, there was like 10, less than 10 people, maybe eight, something like that that endorse that identity and it's harder to look at that identity. So I don't have any good suggestions or solutions to the issue that people have more than one race. And that oftentimes when we're running our regression analyses, we force people into having one race and that might affect our power or might affect what we're saying about folks. But here I wanted to present just the number of people that endorsed each race. And that's what you're seeing here. And um, you can see the weighted um, and the unweighted um, comparisons here. Um, and we had 788 people who endorsed more than one category. So it just goes to show that we have a lot of folks in the US who have more than one race. And um, I don't have any good solutions for regression in terms of how we analyze these things, but I think it's something that we need to start grappling with more as a field. Um, within the Asian American and Pacific Islander, I just wanted to show um, where folks kind of broke down in that sample. And so you can see that we had the highest proportion of folks that chose that they were Chinese. Then of course we had Asian Indians, people that were Filipino, Japanese and Korean and other um, Asian races. And then for the Latina, 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 Latinx and Hispanic um, representation. And I know that it takes a while to say that, but Again, I like to call people what they want to be called and people want to be called all of these things. So that's why I'm using that. Um, you can see here that um, we had the most people endorsed that they were Mexican, Chicano, um, Chicana, Chicanx or Chicane. And then we had um, over 50 people that said they're Puerto Rican, smaller sample of Cuban, but then we had a lot of people who said that they were another. Um, and then, like I said, a lot of them were saying that more than one um, Dominican, Colombian, or Spaniard or Spanish ancestry. Okay, so sexual identity. 
This was our question for sexual identity, and you could again select all that apply. So the options were heterosexual or straight, gay or lesbian, bisexual, same gender loving, queer, pansexual, omnisexual, asexual, don't know, questioning, or something else. And if they said something else, we asked them to specify. And so you can see here how that broke down. We had the most folks who endorsed that they were heterosexual. Um, a lot of folks that said they were gay or lesbian, over 500 that said they were bisexual. And then the other groups are in here. And this again is showing the proportion of people who endorsed each one. So it's not an exclusive, mutually exclusive categories here. About 11% of respondents, which is pretty high, 393 chose more than one sexual identity and ranged from two to nine. There was 96 unique sexual identity combinations, but some of the most common were bisexual plus queer, bisexual plus pansexual, and gay or lesbian plus queer. When we collapse sexual identity, um, and here you can see the weighted and the unweighted results, um, we have um, about half of the sample um, or weighted, it looks like 95% because of the oversampling, but about half of the sample was heterosexual, about 20% was gay or lesbian, about 12% were bisexual, and about 13% were other or multiple identities. So as I've already mentioned that when we're talking about couples um, and describing couples and mentioned about avoiding using the term, using a sexual identity to describe a couple's gender identity, um, you can see here just that among our man-man couples, we have people, not everybody identified as gay, as we might sometimes traditionally think of in these couples. So yes, a lot of them did identify as gay, but we have people that identify as heterosexual, people who identify as bisexual, people identify as other or multiple identities. Same thing for the woman-woman couples, only they were less likely to endorse gay or lesbian um, than the man-man um, couples and more likely to endorse another sexual identity. Among the man-woman couples, um, we have, you know, 78% that said they were heterosexual, but it's still a bunch of folks who did not endorse that. And then among our non-binary couples, which I think is kind of interesting, the majority of our non-binary couples were endorsing that they were other or multiple identities in terms of their sexual identity. So one thing that, of course, we would all like to be able to do more and have more power to do is to think about the intersectional identities of race, ethnicity, and sexual identity. Of course, there's lots of ways to think about intersectionality, but here I'm just taking the, just showing an example of these two items in Unchat. And so you can see here that um, these are folks that are not white and that endorse that they were not heterosexual. So those two intersections. And so you can see that for our um, Hispanic, Latina, 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 Latinx sample, we do have um, over 150 people who endorsed that they were not heterosexual. For our Asian American Pacific Islander sample, we had over 80 folks who endorsed that they were not um, heterosexual. For our indigenous sample, we had about 50-ish. And for our black sample, we had almost 100. And then of course we have our another race um, where we had around 60. So you do have some power to look at the intersections of these identities, maybe not as much power as we sometimes would like to have, but I do think that it's worth thinking about um, and exploring um, the intersections of race, ethnicity, and sexual identity and exploring these in your data. So some other key characteristics of the NCHAT sample, 40%, 6% had a household child under 18. The average age was around 43. About 64% of the sample was employed full-time, about 10% were employed part-time, and about 25% were unemployed. About 40% had a bachelor's degree or more, about 29% had some college, and about a third had high school or less. So there you can see, especially with that education, I think some of us are interested in the intersection of education alone, race and ethnicity or social class by um, sexual identity. And so um, I haven't ran what those look like, but those are just some examples of things you could do with the data. As John said, there's a lot we could do with these data. Okay, so I just wanna give a few highlights from the survey, just to give you some example of some items that are in the survey that you might be interested in. 
So um, as I said before, the survey took about 40 minutes to complete, was gender neutral and inclusive, was collected on Qualtrics, and we actually like reached the limit of cells that you could use in Qualtrics, which um, was kind of exciting for Gallup. We had to delete a few years that you could endorse that you were born because of it. So it's pretty interesting. We definitely used Qualtrics and had it do things that who knew it could even do. Um, you can access it at pop.umn.edu slash nchat. To be considered a complete survey, and these are things like you have to think about whenever <laughs> you're collecting these data, something I never really thought that much about before, but to be considered a complete survey, respondents are required to make it to the end of the survey and have enough demographic information to be weighted. So the survey, um, as I mentioned, includes main respondent and partner demographics. Of course, we have information about employment, such as like exposure to COVID-19 and um, indicators of work-family conflict. Um, we have a full household roster, and we also know about non-household children as well. Uh, we have COVID-specific questions such as your perception of how risk, much risk you have, um, social distancing, how disrupted your life is. Um, relationship functioning, we have a few different measures there, including some direct items, such including like how do you think your relationship has changed since the pandemic. We have relationship milestones. So we have um, cohabitation and marital histories, as well as relationship milestones for your own relationships. So like, when did you start living together? Uh, when did you get married? If you did get married, what kind of ceremony did you have? Um, because some of our folks may have gotten married before they could legally get married. So these are all things that we asked about. We also have information about finances, such as income, pregnancy and fertility, um, intimate partner violence, and including some questions specific to our respondents that weren't heterosexual. So for example, um, whether your partner had threatened to out you is an example of one of those items. Uh, of course, information about the division of labor, because I'm interested in that, um, including information about um, household planning and management, which I think is kind of novel. Um, and I do believe people understood kind of what we meant by that. Um, physical and psychological well-being indicators, community context, and I think I have some indicators of this that I'll show you, but those items are like, is your community a good place for people that are transgender to live, for example? Um, so that's kind of a direct perception in addition to these structural measures that we're looking on that you can compare. Um, alcohol, smoking, and drug use, um, HIV status, and also whether people are using PrEP discrimination indicators. Um, so we have everyday discrimination and then information about your family of origin as well. And for that, we did ask people to report on who they were answering those questions about. So we didn't just ask about a mom and a dad and didn't make an assumption that everybody had different gender parents. Okay, so just an example of just some frequencies for a few items, just so you can kind of get an idea of some examples of what we have. In the past week, have you been less stressed, more stressed, or had the same amount of stress as before the coronavirus pandemic? Which is slightly surprising that about 61% of people said they had the same amount of stress, about a 30 were more stressed, and about 9% said that they were actually less stressed than before. In terms of your life being disrupted, to what extent had your life been affected or disrupted by the coronavirus situation? We had 43% said that it had been affected a fair amount. 27% said it had been affected a great deal, but we had 26% say not much and 3% say not at all. But this is something I think a lot of us think about, which is what are people doing to cope with the pandemic and how are people, what were, what were people doing, especially during, you know, those lockdowns that we had where we were supposed to stay home before our vaccines, which most of NCHAT was collected during that time. So watching TV or gaming was popular. I know I watched the all the episodes of Parks and Rec with my family during the <laughs> during the pandemic. Um, anybody like Leslie Nope? So that was fun. Um, connecting with friends or family, exercising or walking, getting plenty of sleep, um, taking a break from news or social media. I was just listening to a, an NPR thing about that this morning. Praying or meditating, eating more food than usual 
drinking alcohol, connecting with the religious community. Anybody hear about the woman who wore a different hat every single Sunday to her virtual Zoom church? Um, that was she could she could be in that one. Connecting with healthcare um, providers, smoking cigarettes or vaping, using drugs, eating less food than usual as opposed to eating more food than usual, and then cutting or self injury was the least um, likely one that people endorsed in terms of what they were doing. And by the way, you could say more than one of these. You could say as many of these as you wanted to say that you were doing during the pandemic. In terms of racial trauma, the item that we created was how has the recent movement for racial equity sparked by the killing of George Floyd influenced your stress? And I wanted to say that we use that term killing as opposed to murder because this was before the trial and everything else. So this is the reason why we had this language here. Um, and you can see that 8% of people said it impacted them a great deal, 26% said a fair amount, and then you had 35% say not much and 31% say not at all. So you can imagine um, that there is definitely demographic indicators that can predict who is in which of these groups. And we have a paper coming out looking at some of these items. I think it should be out by the end of the year in this Russell Sage Foundation special issue. In terms of community context, this is, is the city or area you live a good place or not a good place to live for racial and ethnic minorities? You could say about a third of people think that the place they live is a good place. Um, about 32% say four, 26% say three, and then you have some people saying it's not a good place and endorsing um, those lower, having the lower endorsement on that item. We also ask people, is a city or area you live a good place or not a good place to live for people who are gay, lesbian, or bisexual? And you can see numbers look pretty similar, though maybe just a little bit higher in terms of some of the negative um, endorsement. And then this is for the transgender and non-binary folks. Is a city or area you live a good place or not a good place to live for people who are transgender and non-binary? And there was more negativity. People had poor perceptions of their communities around this item. Um, so you have less endorsement of a good place or five or four and more endorsement of the midpoint or the lower um, options. In terms of relationship satisfaction since COVID, which I think a lot of us kind of think about um, in terms of just even talking with folks, comes up a lot when I talk about NCHAT. In the past week, have you been less satisfied, more satisfied, or had the same level of satisfaction with your relationship as before the pandemic? And about 65% of people perceived they had about the same level of satisfaction. About 25% actually said they were more satisfied. So people were more likely to say that they are more satisfied with their relationship than they were likely to say less satisfied. And I want to give a shout out to Lisa Neff here, my colleague at the University of Texas, Austin in HDFS. I was visiting there and she was telling me about some work that she was doing. I think some of it's been published. So check out her Google Scholar. And it shows that people, some of the reasons why people may have been more satisfied during the pandemic is they had something to blame their problems on that was not their partner. So if they were like, you know, having an argument, they could say, oh, it's that darn pandemic making us have a problem and not the insensitivity of your partner. So when you have something external to blame things on, it can help your relationship. So check that out. In terms of distance education, I don't know, for those of you that homeschooled, I had four children that were in grades. What were they in? I think they were in second grade through 11th grade during the pandemic. Um, I just get traumatized even seeing this item. Are your children currently attending school in person, online, or are they homeschooled? Please select all that apply. Um, and so here, a lot of people were, did have their children in online school. Some people had it on an in-person school. And again, this is before um, the vaccines were available. So part of that reason why a lot of the kids were still in online school during that time. Some other COVID specific questions we asked people, have you ever received a coronavirus test? And about 57% of people at that point had not, which is, you know, as somebody who does a lot of testing now that they're more widely available, it was surprising, but this is when it was harder to get a test. Um, did you test positive for coronavirus? We had about 15% who had had a test that said, yes, I did. And about 3% were waiting for results. Then we asked folks, do you personally have someone in your household who is likely to suffer serious complications if infected? And about a third or 30% of folks said that they did. Um, and then in terms of people, have you ever been ill or suspected you may be ill with the coronavirus? Because remember, and sometimes it was hard to even get a test in those um, first months of the pandemic. 
about 20% of the samples said I've had coronavirus or suspected I've had it. About 1% said I currently or have it or suspect I have it. And about 80% said that they had not had it. And um, I'll just pause here for a second. We're going to be taking a break. Okay, and so our NCHAT time diaries are modeled off the American Time Use Survey. They collect information about the following from 4 a.m. to 4 a.m. the following day, so primary and secondary activities. And push notifications are sent at 8 a.m. noon, 4 p.m., 8 p.m., and 8 a.m. the following day. So let's talk about time diary data for a second. Like, why would you want to use time diary data and what's exciting about it? So the reason why I wanted to collect time diary data in NCHAT is because I'm really interested in work and family and how people spend time in housework and paid work and um, the division of labor. And if you're interested in these issues, you can ask people just to self-report how much time they spent washing the dishes. Or maybe I could ask all of you, you know, how much time do you think you spent on your phone yesterday? And then you would probably go into your app on your phone or you would actually track it. You would actually, like my kids, you know, I'll say, oh, can you load the dishwasher? And they act like they're going to die because it's so much work that they have to load the dishwasher. But then you time it, it actually takes like 10 minutes. Um, even with our large family, it doesn't take very long, but it feels like it takes longer. Or when you're on your phone, you know, that's the opposite. Like it feels like it goes by really fast, but when you look at your time on your phone, you get that like annual report or the weekly report about how much time you spent on your phone. You might be completely freaked out by how much time you actually spent on your phone. And that's because we're bad at estimating our time. So the nice thing about time diary data is you have to account for every minute of your day. And so you get a better estimate of how people are spending their time. Also how you spend your time kind of can be somewhat of a reflection of um, maybe what's important to you or maybe the constraints that you're under um, in terms of your personal life or your family life or your work life. And so there's a lot of information we can learn from how people spend their time. And that's the reason why we're using the time diary data. It was a priority for us to collect those data. I do have one paper with the new parents project data, um, which is a study of uh, new people that were pregnant women and men that were expecting their first child, cis men, cis women, um, in central Ohio that we that I collected with my colleague, Sarah Shapi Sullivan, where we lined up um, the dad's data with the mom's data minute by minute. And you could do that with the NCHAT data if they answer on the same day. And you can really learn a lot from how people spend their time even on the same minutes in a family. And so I'm excited about these data and to share them with all of you. And um, they will be in the virtual data enclave, and uh, we're working on answering a few more questions about the items there, and then we'll be cleaning those and getting those to you. But that's the reason why I'm excited about the time diary data. Okay, so my thing is back over here. Okay, great. So how do you spend your time? So it took us a while to get this list together because um, just wanting to have more detailed activities. So these are some of those time diary activities we have. You could be sleeping or napping. Um, doing grooming or, you know, showering, getting dressed, getting a haircut, attending a medical appointment. You could be eating, cooking, baking, picking up food. I remember in the New Parents Project, we had a lot of picking up food because people had babies and maybe didn't feel like cooking. Um, you could be working or attending a work event or checking email messages related to work. Look, or you could be looking for work, right? Working on job applications. Uh, we do have an indicator in NCHAT of whether people were furloughed or not, for example. Um, for childcare, you could look at caring for children, um, playing, reading, or spending time with children, uh, dropping or picking up children, attending children's events. So we did try to separate out like the engagement, which is kind of like the fun kind of parenting where you're playing or reading or spending time with them, and the caring kind of um, childcare, which um, some people might call maybe sometimes less enjoyable, especially if you're changing a diaper or something like that. Or I, I'm not a big fan of helping with homework. Maybe some of you enjoy that. Um, household repair. So you have cleaning, doing laundry, doing home improvement, paying bills, scheduling appointment, um, you know, taking care of your pets. We just did that yesterday. My pets just got their hair cut. Um, driving or traveling or flying, um, socializing, relaxing. So I know we don't think we have a lot of leisure, but there's a lot of different things that are considered leisure. We do ask about things related to sexuality in the socializing, relaxing, or leisure, sometimes those are coded as like other activities, I think, in the American Time Use Survey, but this is a couple survey, so we do have some more detailed information here about spending time with your partner, so we have like playing games or video games, relaxing, thinking, daydreaming, um, running errands, shopping, for um, drug use and smoking, we have whether they were vaping or smoking or 
and what if they were smoking what were they smoking or doing drugs um then we have studying or attending school providing care for an adult exercising volunteering and i don't know after each activity um so people could report um who was there while they were doing it where they were there were they alone? Were they with a household member? And if they were, who was it? So like, were you with your partner, for example? Um, were your parents there, step-parents, your in-laws, et cetera? We also asked if they were involved in the activity. And that was something that sometimes we saw in my in the in New Parents Project is that sometimes when dads were parenting, moms were involved. And so you could see who was involved in the activity as well. And also it's interesting because like for thinking about couple relationships, you know, you might like whenever I mentioned that I watched Parks and Rec with my family. Well, most of the time, I believe we were all actually watching the show and nobody was on their phone, but someone could have been on their phone and just totally ignoring um, the TV show too, right? And then how much are they really being involved in the activity? They were also asked um, where they were. So were they inside their home? Were they someplace else? They were also asked about technology use. So were you using another device while you were doing this? So like, let's say you were relaxing with your partner. Were you using a smartphone and tablet or laptop during that as well? And then we were asked how much alcohol you consumed if they reported drinking. So how many drinks did they consume? And then after every activity, they were also asked um, how happy, stressed, or engaged they felt during the activity. So how happy they felt, how stressed they felt during it, and then how engaged they were. And I remember when we were talking about these items, like Lena Sear saying that you could be watching a TV show like The Crown, and you might be on your phone while you're watching it, but you might actually be on your phone because you're Googling whether what you just watched in The Crown actually happened. Or you could be on your phone scrolling through Instagram or Twitter or TikTok or whatever other things that you consume, and then your partner laughs at something and then they look at you to see if you're paying attention and then you didn't laugh and then they know that you really weren't paying attention and maybe it negatively impacts your marital quality. So anyway, we do have whether you were um, on your phone and how engaged you were in the activity. Um, they, uh, they did answer, I didn't mention this earlier, I don't know, I have a slide on this, but you did ask, we did ask if for the main activity and what you were doing at the same time. So you could report, you did, we do have secondary activities. Um, one of my favorite examples of a secondary activity was a mom in the New Parents Project who was peeling potatoes, holding the baby, and like doing something else. I forget what it was all at the same time. Um, and so she maybe was like some kind of gymnast person. I don't know. But people do sometimes report more than one activity at the same time. Okay, then at the very end of the time diary, so at the end of the day, after they answered all the items, they were again asked this land, the Cantrell scale here, which is on which step of the ladder would you say you personally feel you stand at this time? You were also asked um, if you experienced any discrimination during that day. And these are some of the same items that we have in the main survey about discrimination. And then we also asked them how frequently if they endorsed one of these items, like for example, if they endorsed people acted as if they were better than you, then we asked how frequently did you experience that? between the start of the day and the end of the day. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. I will also say that there was no, um, how do I say this? Everybody is asked these discrimination questions regardless of your identities. So I just wanna mention that, you, that these are asked of everybody. And then they were also asked about their sleep, the quality of their sleep that day. Um, so I think that's something that could be interesting. Like, what if you reported discrimination that day? And did you, did, is that correlated with how the quality of people sleep? Um, to be considered a complete time diary, you had to meet the following criteria, report at least five activities. And this is similar to some of the same rules they use in the American Time Use Survey. You had to report two of three basic activities, which included eating, sleeping, and personal care. You had to have fewer than three hours of, I don't know, and I can't remember, and you had to complete it at least through 8 p.m. of the time diary day. And Hun, shout out to Hun Jay, who helped with figuring out who actually had a complete time diary. And just a snapshot of some of the time diary sample. You can see here we had about 1,900 folks that were in that sample. The age was around 40, um, about 23% were um, Hispanic or Latina, Latino, Latina, Latinx, about 80% white, 20% other races, um, a majority, are these weighted? I don't know. 
about a thousand were heterosexual, about 256 were gay or lesbian, must be weighted, I think maybe, um, 266 bisexual and another identity was 247, about half and half men and women. Um, some 65% were employed full-time, but uh, several, you know, were not. And about 45% had at least one child in the household. So just some preliminary characteristics of the partner and dyadic data. And our project manager made these. So maybe I'll have some more information about the part, partner and dyadic data here. Um, I did look at these quickly, but now I'm wondering if maybe what we talked about isn't here. The partners look similar to the primary respondents in terms of their, their ethnicity. Um, but about 23% of couples are considered inter-ethnic and about 8% of couples included both partners who reported a Hispanic or a Latino, Latina, Latinx, Latina um, ethnicity. In terms of race, oh, here's some information about race for the couples. So we have about a thousand same race couples that they're both white, about a hundred same race couples that they are both black and about 50 same race couples, but they're both Asian or Asian American. And then um, for uh, interracial couples, um, you can see some of the breakdowns there in terms of um, the N and the primary respondent and the multiracial partners. And so you can get all of this information um, from the um, respondents. And then in terms of gender from the partner data, you have 226 man-man couples, about 200 woman-woman couples, um, fewer that were um, neither of those, um, about 968 man-woman, man or another gender, about 32, and woman in another gender, about 40. And so um, in terms of the actual unweighted percentages, you have about 29% same gender and about 70% different gender in terms of the ends. For sexual identity in terms of that, so about 70% of the couples when unweighted had the same sexual identity, but about 28% didn't, which is kind of interesting. Um, and so um, we have this coded in terms of exclusively heterosexual or exclusively gay or lesbian or bisexual or another or multiple identities. Um, and you do have, and by the way, so everything that is in the main respondent survey, the partner at, answered the exact same survey. So the main respondent answered, you know, information about their partner or partners. So if they had more than one partner, um, more than one romantic partner that they were living with, they answered demographic information and all the partner information about both partners, but we did ask them to choose a single partner to answer the survey about. And um, we, so they only answered the survey about one partner. And when in terms of waiting, because we did have some folks that answered the survey um, and had different gendered partners that they were living with. So they, so let's pretend that the main respondent was a cis woman and they were living with a cis man as a romantic partner and a cis woman as a romantic partner. Um, the data were weighted to the person they answered the survey about so that the, to give them a weight because the weighting um, depends on the gender identity of the couple. <laughs> 